In your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. We are going through this chapter verse by verse, and we are up to a certain point in verse 14. So we'll read where we've been, but first let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what this day represents as we celebrate Mother's Day and, and how important the home is with the father and the mother in the home, Lord, a, a divine institution that you ordained, and Lord, we, we thank you for it. We pray for mothers all over this globe, especially mothers that are members of the body of Christ, that they would see how important their role is in your plan. Give them courage and strength to stand in a time where there's so much attack against you, Lord, through, through your institution of family and marriage. So, Lord, we just lift that up to you, and may we hold the course as we wait for our Lord and Savior Jesus to one day return for us at the rapture of the church, and also return to this earth one day to rule a kingdom, a perfect kingdom of righteousness, as we're studying today. In Jesus, we lift this up. Amen. Starting in verse 11, let's just read the whole section. <clears throat> John says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven... Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he'll, as he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, and he said to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come and assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword which came out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. <clears throat> so last time we left off in verse 14, which says, The armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses, following Jesus. So when Christ returns on a white horse, he's accompanied by a heavenly army also on white horses, with the army adorned in fine linen that is white and clean. So let's look at this, because I think the fact that they're on white horses like Jesus indicates their solidarity with the Lord. In other words, this army is on the side of God, not an opposing army. He's, Jesus is coming back to do war with the opposing army on earth. I think being on white horses and wearing clean white linen also indicates the purity of the army. But if you look at this closely, unlike the Messiah who possessed a broad sword, the army possesses no weapons or armor. Does it indicate they have anything? except just garments on that are white and clean. So not having armor, I think, indicates that they're immortal, therefore not subject to physical harm. And if this army is the church or includes believers of the church, aren't we resurrected by this time? Uh, and our bodies are not subject to decay or any harm. Not having armor may also indicate that they're not coming to participate in the fighting but that the Messiah will defeat the enemy single-handedly. Is he capable of doing that, in your opinion? Absolutely. 
And when the broadsword comes out of Messiah's mouth, as we'll see in verse 15, it indicates that he alone strikes down the nations. Because all through that verse are singular pronouns referring to Jesus. So the Messiah winning the victory all by himself fits well with the prophecy given 700 years before Jesus by Isaiah in Isaiah 63. And I put this on the slide above. So this is the context when Isaiah asked the Messiah, why are your garments stained red? And the Messiah responds in verse 3, I have trodden the wine trough alone. The Hebrew word means alone. And from the peoples, there was no man with me. I, I, singular, also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. So he seems to do it alone here, and I think that's the case in Revelation 19, even though there's a heavenly army with him. So the Lord comes with a heavenly army. And I think these are holy ones. And wouldn't that be in fulfillment of other prophetic passages? How about Zechariah, the post-exilic prophet? Uh, Turn to Zechariah. Verse 5 is on the slide mentioning the holy ones coming with him. But let's just look at verses 1 through 4. And show how this is prophecy, something that hasn't happened yet. So remember, Zechariah prophesies when they come back from Babylon. Then Jesus will eventually show up at his first advent offering the kingdom, but Zechariah 14 did not come to fruition. But it will at his second advent. Now clearly Jesus, it says... His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He was on the Mount of Olives. Remember, he gave the Olivet Discourse, but I don't think that's what Zechariah is referring to. This is when he comes back in judgment to establish the kingdom, which was rejected by Israel at his first advent. So Zechariah 14.1 says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. So that's prophetic. In other words, the day that is coming is the tribulation followed by the second advent. When the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. So Israel will be a a, a people that had had the spoil taken from them, but it goes back at the Messiah's return when he blesses them. It says, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. See, the Lord's going to do battle against the nations as it says the broadsword will come out of his mouth to strike the nations in Revelation 19. So he'll go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. Now, notice this did not happen at the first advent because it says the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now here it is, verse 5 in the middle. Then the Lord my God will come and all his kol kodashim, all his holy ones with him. So I think this is fulfilled in Revelation 19 when he returns on the white horse with an army following him. Another passage that speaks of the Lord coming with his holy ones is in the book of Jude. Turn to Jude. Let's see who finds it first because it's on one page on one side. If you sneeze, you'll miss it. Very close to the end of the New Testament. Now, Jude is prophesying about the divine judgment that will come on, I think, unbelievers in context. Very harsh judgment in the book of Jude. 
in this section. So Jude 14 and 15, remember it's one chapter, so we're just looking at two verses. If you want to say Jude 1, 14 and 15, I'm okay with that. You'll still go to heaven. But it's some Bibles that will just say Jude 14, the 14th verse. So in verse 14, it was also about these men, so those that are under judgment, that Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied. And what did he say? Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly and all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So I think this prophecy points to the glorious return of Jesus Christ to the earth at his second coming when he'll judge the ungodly. Uh, I'm going to make a point of something. I have it highlighted in yellow. It says, do you have, behold, the Lord came, like a past tense? Does anyone have the Lord is coming? One translation. Okay, so we got different translations in here. Well, you, you have edu elthen kurios, behold, the Lord came. Now, the word came is the Greek word erchomai. It's translated with a past tense in a lot of Bibles. He came. The Lord came, which it sounds like something that's already happened, right? So some will say, see, this has already occurred. This is not future. It's not prophecy. I still think it's the second advent. And I think um, what we need to do with this is realize the word came is in the aorist tense, which is usually a past tense. But sometimes this is called a proleptic aorist. So you can use the aorist tense, a past tense, to show the certainty of a future event. It's so certain to happen, it's already, it's looked at as a past event. You understand? And I think that's the idea here. So some translations may say he came, he comes, is coming. He's definitely coming. It's just put in a past tense because it's so certain to happen as a future event. And what, who does he come with? It says with many thousands of his holy ones. So when Jesus returns, it will be with many thousands of his holy ones. And the word uh, many thousands translates the Greek word myriads, where we get myriads. You ever heard that? Myriads and myriads. Myrias really means 10,000. And it's in the plural. So it's just an, ama an amazing amount of holy ones that will come. And I don't think there's any attempt to be exact with the number. I just think it's just multitudes and multitudes, myriads and myriads will return. So even though the text isn't being exact, do you think God knows the exact number? I mean, to the T, as we say. So the holy ones who come with Christ could refer to angels, right? Or it could just refer to saved human beings or a combination. Um, some think the army is only angelic beings, uh, Deuteronomy 33.2 talks about a holy assemble of angelic beings who were present at Mount Sinai when the Jews left Egypt, which is fascinating all in itself. Deuteronomy 33.2, remember the Jews leave Egypt, they get to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. Moses writes Deuteronomy, which is a series of sermons to encourage the second generation to obey the Lord in the land when they get there. But Deuteronomy 33, 2 says, He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At His right hand there was flashing lightning for them. So these seem to be angelic beings that accompanied the Lord at Sinai. Um, pretty amazing angelology if this is the case. All through Scripture, we learn about how angels appear, how God uses them, and so forth. However, well, not however, on top of that, the Bible clearly states that angels will accompany Jesus at His second advent. Listen to these. Matthew 13, 41, the Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. Now, Matthew 13 is a prophecy of the future at His second advent. Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then will repay every man according to His deeds. 
2 Thessalonians 1, 7, to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well as when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Mark 8, 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, talking about Israel, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now he has the word holy there, which indicates elect angels rather than fallen angels. However, <laughs> so are angels coming with Jesus or is it church saints? Believers in Christ are also called holy ones. 1 Corinthians 1-2. Everyone in the church of Corinth was called sanctified or holy. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Ephesians 1.15, 1, Ephesians 1.18. Constantly believers in Christ are called holy because we're in Him who is holy. So go back toward Revelation. We'll go into Revelation. Look at 17.14. Even in the very book we're in, or just a couple of chapters later, Jesus comes with this multitude on white horses Revelation 17, 14 indicates redeemed human beings will accompany Jesus as well. And if this is the case, this is very interesting for your life, right? Because what are you going to be doing with the Lord when He returns, coming back? Boy, talk about an aerial view. Revelation 17, 14, these will wage war against the Lamb... And the Lamb will overcome them. See, the Messiah accomplishes the victory single-handedly. Why? Because He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. What does Revelation 19 say? He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And those who are with Him are, look, the called and the chosen and the faithful. That seems to describe faithful human believers or those the elect, if you will, the elect of God. And I know elect can refer to angels too. But believers are called called ones, chosen ones, and faithful. So I think it's redeemed human beings in that passage. And on top of this, Christ's bride, remember from earlier in chapter 19, which is a reference to the church, his bride, is wearing fine linen, clean linen like those returning with him on white horses. Look at 19.8. Speaking of the bride, which is the church, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the holy ones or the saints, which I think are believers. So this is my view of prophecy, and I, there's a other, an, other dispensations, I believe, before Israel and the law, but I ran out of space on the slide. I couldn't fit it all in. So remember, Jesus comes under the law of Moses. The law of Moses was given to the Jews at Sinai through, through Moses. The law will come to an end at the cross, Hebrews 7, 12. The church age begins in Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter gives his sermon, the Spirit comes upon them. That begins the church, which forms Jew and Gentile in the body equally under Christ, the head of the church. And I think at the end of the church, when God chooses, He will take His whole bride, the church, off the earth, called the rapture, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, uh, 16 through 18. And we, all those who are dead in Christ, will rise first, and we who are alive at that time, if anyone's alive on earth, will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, remember, I... Go to, I go to prepare a place for you, but I will come back. I'll, it's his father's house, remember? Just like at a wedding ceremony, the father's house would be prepared. The groom would take the bride to the father's house in, in Jewish weddings. So that Jesus returns to his father, but he will come back for his church and then take them back to heaven. And so we will be in the father's house for seven years. And then at the second advent, we return with Jesus and then he'll subdue his enemies, and then he'll reign in his kingdom. And guess what we get to do in the kingdom? Reign with him. 
Revelation 5.10, you have made them a kingdom to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Now, there's a long d a discussion on does everyone get to rule or only obedient people get to rule? I think everyone will rule in some capacity, but I think the obedient will get to rule with greater capacity and more reward. Um, I've already gone through that discussion, when we, I think, when I went through Revelation 5.10, but clearly, believers will rule at his return in the millennial kingdom. So you guys are all going to have some responsibility in that kingdom when you're after resurrection, then you return with the Lord. The church will rule. Uh, Jesus will be on David's throne in Jerusalem. Israel will have all their land boundaries as promised in the Old Testament. And the nations will be outside of the promised land. And what do we get to do? I think we'll have some jurisdiction over them. Um, Paul told the Corinthians, don't you know that you will judge angels? Have you ever thought of that? Remember, they couldn't even handle law courts in their day, uh, suing their own brothers and so forth. So to get them to realize what they're doing was wrong, he says, one day you will judge angels. I think we need to get out of this body, though, to do it, right? So when you read Scripture, you'll see these little comments occasionally going, whoa, there's something amazing coming for all of us. And sometimes we're so busy worrying about the day that we forget what's coming. So worry about the day, but always be looking at everything in light of eternity. It sure makes everything grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Hey, I wrote a song. <laughs> Y'all know that song, right? So Revelation 19 could be describing both redeemed human believers as well as angelic beings returning with Christ. Good arguments are made on both sides, and I, I think it's very defensible to have both. Some would say, well, Revelation 19 is just dealing with believers contextually. It doesn't mean that angels won't come too from other passages. Now we go to verse 15. So out of Jesus' mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. Now keep this phrase in mind, he will rule them with a rod of iron. It's going to get a little challenging and a little tricky. Some of it, I'm just going to have to ask you, if you want more detail, meet me at the break. Um, I'll try to give enough detail so you may not have to, but... There's a couple of things that some might want to, and I'm definitely willing to discuss it. And then he'll tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So remember, I have it at the bottom of the slide. When John was on the island of Patmos in 95 AD, when Jesus appeared to him in glory, as we've already seen that chapter, Jesus had a sword coming out of his mouth in that description. Revelation 1.16, in Jesus' right hand, he had seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. So here's the Lord in this glorious appearing and resurrection to John, and he had a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, which I think is symbolic. So I think it's a symbol of judgment. A judgment that will be accomplished by the Lord. How, though? A literal sharp sword coming out of his mouth? His word. And what's interesting, when Christ returns, Paul even wrote by the Spirit that Jesus will destroy the Antichrist by his word. Listen to um, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Then that lawless one, that's the Antichrist, he will be revealed. So he's going to... Now, he could be already born now. We don't know. He could be an adult now. He could be ready to sign that covenant with Israel for seven years. What? In the next few weeks. The church, I think, will have to be remo removed first. Then the covenant will be signed. So that lawless one will one day come on the scene. And I know we've been speculating since the early church on who that antichrist is, right? And we've always been wrong. <laughs> but he will be revealed, and I think uh, it'll be very clear who he is. 
his number is the number of man, 666. So I think in Hebrew gematria, his name will add up to that. You can take each letter of the Hebrew alphabet and do its numerical value, and it will come up to that number. I don't think he's playing a game and trying to hide himself. I think he'll be very, um, it'll be very understood who he is. But notice what the Lord's going to do. One, after he's revealed at the end of the tribulation, it says the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth. It doesn't say anything about a sword. But I think that's the idea. His judgment will just simply be what he says. Because if he can speak a universe into existence, can he speak judgment on his, against his people? Against people who go against him, excuse me. And it says he'll also bring to an end uh, the Antichrist by the appearance of his coming. So the, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. And notice it says in verse 15, so that with it he'll strike down the nations. Now, I think these are Gentiles. The word nation can refer to the Jews. Typically in the Greek language, ethnos refers to the Gentiles. And I think we got Gentile nations referred to here. So hold your place. And keep a marker in Psalm 2. Uh, I keep coming back to Psalm 2 since I've been going through Revelation. Over and over, I come back to Psalm 2. We're going to see Psalm 2 again. I, I, as I was reading the Scripture this morning, the whole passage, I saw another time I'm going to have to introduce Psalm 2. So if you get to heaven and you don't know Psalm 2, the Lord's going to say, were you not listening? <laughs> so look at Psalm 2.1. Keep your place in Revelation. Now, this is a messianic psalm about Messiah that King David wrote, about the, the king and his line. I mean, David's from Judah. Did you see why I had Mark read Genesis 49? Some of you went, what in the heck does that have to do with the price of tea in China? But notice Judah is a lion's whelp. Judah will have the, is the tribe for whom the Messiah will come who will hold the scepter. So there's a lion from the tribe of Judah. Have we heard that? Revelation 5. So Jesus is that king that will come from the tribe of Judah. David is from Judah, and God told David, one in your line from Judah will rule. So all this ties together like a nice tapestry. So Psalm 2, 1. Now, if Jesus will strike down the nations at his second coming, look how Psalm 2, 1 begins. Why are the who? Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? So these are the nations that Jesus will strike down in Revelation 19. So here's the prophecy of it. Verse 2, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together, not with the Lord, but what? Against the Lord, that's God the Father, and against his anointed, that's Messiah. So the word anointed, y'all ever heard of the Christ? In Hebrew, Mashiach means to anoint or the anointed one. So that means the Messiah, the Christ, or the Anointed One. So we know Jesus Christ is this one. Christos means anointed in Greek. So they're going to take their counsel or their stand against God the Father and against His anointed God the Son. Now listen to what they say, because what they say is found in verse 3. So the nations in disobedience who are going in attack mode against God, look what they say. Tell me if this doesn't sound like a lot of leaders in our culture, a lot of people in our culture, a lot of people in this world. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, the evil nations want freedom from the Lord's power and authority. They want to be independent of God. They think the Lord is oppressing them and denying them true freedom. But Satan's the ruler of this world who's got them in slavery, and they don't even see it. Is really the Lord the problem? No, he's the solution. They don't see it that way. They want freedom from God. And how many people just want God out of everything? But how does God respond? Well, the one sitting in heaven laughs. He scoffs at them. As if they're going to assemble this army of human beings against the living God who created a universe. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. And here's what God says, but as for me, that's the Father, 
I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So that's Jesus, the king who will rule from Jerusalem. And I'll surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He, that's the father, said to me, the son. So the son of God, Jesus says, this is what the father said of me. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now there's a lot of discussion on what is begotten you mean here. I think this is what's going to happen at Jesus' coronation as king. Because in the ancient world, every time a, a king in the line of Judah was coronated, they would quote Psalm 2. And they'd say, this is God's son, small s, as they're waiting for the ultimate Davidic son, capital S. You see? So they would quote this because they're waiting for the Messiah to come from the line of Judah because the line of Judah will bring the Messiah. And that line can never be cut off, which it never was, because if you read Matthew 1, the genealogy shows uh, all those generations were from David to Jesus, the line never broke. And then he says in verse 8, ask of me and I'll surely give the nations as your inheritance. So Jesus will rule. And notice the very ends of the earth as your possession. So the Father is going to give Jesus the possession of the land. Daniel 7, um, 13 and 14. Remember, the Ancient of Days will give Jesus the kingdom, and he'll rule everyone that, that is saved, obviously. So notice, he's going to take possession of not just Jerusalem and the Promised Land, but the whole earth. And I think this shows the extent of Messiah's rule in the kingdom. Uh, no sanctuary cities, right? His rule will be everywhere, globally, Nothing's outside of his jurisdiction. It covers the entire earth. So again, leave a marker here. I'll be back. So again, in Revelation 19, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Now, take note of this. I mean, don't lose sleep over it. But at least this gets a little complicated when we go back to Psalms. And I, I think I have a solution to smooth it out. The, do you have the word rule? Okay, it's not the typical wor word to rule as a king. Like basaluo, kingdom basaleia. And that word was available, I mean, I think in Revelation 5.10, when we will rule with him, it uses basaluo, to reign like a king, as a servant king. However, this is the word poimino. Anyone know what poimino means? It means to shepherd, like you would shepherd sheep. So you could put, and he'll shepherd them with a rod of iron. Now, a shepherd carries a rod, doesn't he? This is an iron rod which I think has something to do with his, his strong judgment and rule and authority. So this word does mean to shepherd sheep. It's used that way in, as I have up there, I've got some info for you. Matthew 2, 6, it's used of Jesus, the one from the tribe of Judah who will shepherd his people. It's also used for pastors, shepherding believers in the church. You ever heard of a pastor teacher? Well, the word pastor is a word for a shepherd under the chief shepherd, Jesus. 1 Peter 5.2, Peter tells elders to shepherd the flock of God well. You could say rule, but it's the word for shepherding sheep. So ruling or shepherding with a rod of iron, I think, indicates strength, power, and authority, which will accompany Jesus' rule, no doubt. Now, look back, and it's on the slide. I think if you just want to look up here, that might be enough, but you can turn back there. So he'll rule with a rod of iron in Revelation 19.15, but Revelation 2.26 and 27 says the same thing. And this has its challenges. Verse 26, speaking of the ch to the church, he who overcomes... And he who keeps my deeds until the end. So that's obedience, right? To him, God says, I'll give authority over the nations. Now, isn't that the believer? What do we get if we 
overcome and then do well, we get a reward. We get ruling authority with Christ. So Jesus rules the kingdom as the king, but believers share in that rule. Now look at verse 27, and here's a challenging thing. And he, is he Jesus or the believer? He will rule them with a rod of iron. There's poimino again for shepherding. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. So in 27, is the he Jesus or believers? I put capital H there to throw you off. I, it could go either way, but I think it's the believer. And the reason I do is because he says, as I also have received authority from my Father. So Jesus had delegated authority from the Father to rule the kingdom, but we co-rule with him. You understand? Again, there's another passage on our responsibility as a ruler. Then you go to Revelation 12, 5, it says the same thing about Jesus. He will rule or shepherd with a rod of iron. So in Revelation 12, you're in the midpoint of the tribulation contextually because it's seven years, so you're right in the middle of the three-and-a-half-year point. And it talks about Jesus, I think, being born at his first advent and then being caught up to heaven, um, then returning later. So it says, she gave birth to a son, and, the, and she is the woman, which is Israel. Genesis 37 describes Israel in this language of Revelation 12. But out of the woman, national Israel, who gave birth to Jesus? Mary, a Jew from the tribe of Judah. And notice it's a male child. Was Jesus a male child? Who, and, and then it says, who will rule? Do you have who will rule or who is about to rule? It doesn't say who is to rule. It says who's about to rule. So this is saying it's impending. He isn't ruling in, at that time. He wasn't ruling as king at his first advent. He won't be ruling during the tribulation. But he will rule when he returns. So he's about to rule or shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Well, Revelation 12 was a lot of fun to go through. But Jesus was born into this world. God became flesh, John 1.14, through Mary, who was from the woman or the nation Israel. He offered the kingdom to Israel, first advent. That kingdom offer was rejected by Israel. He then was caught up to heaven. When would that be? After his resurrection, he ascended to heaven, Acts 1. He's now seated at the right hand of God on the Father's throne. Then one day he'll return at the second advent, rule with a rod of iron on David's throne. David's throne is earthly. I think he's on the Father's throne now in heaven. It's not David's throne. The kingdom has not been put in place yet. How are y'all doing? Good. You're supposed to say, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Psalm 2.9. Go back there. So Jesus ruling with a rod of iron, or shepherding with a rod of iron, as it says, in Revelation 2, 27, 12, 5, and 19, 15, looks back to Psalm 2. Look what Psalm 2, 9 says. He will break them with a rod of iron. That's when he comes back to rule as king, right? After he defeats the nations, Psalm 2, 1 through 8. God will install his king on Zion. He returns. He breaks them with a rod of iron. He'll shatter them like earthenware. Now, does the text say you will shepherd them with a rod of iron? How many of you have break? It reads you will break them with a rod of iron in the Hebrew. Now, this is where if you want a discussion on why the Septuagint has shepherd, the Hebrew has break, I'm not going to cover that now. Um, 
figured it's, a, it's complex enough so far, right? But if you want to talk about that, there's some reasons why from the Hebrew text it could have been, or why some may take it as shepherd. But I prefer the translation, you will break them, because look at the parallel line. You will break them with a rod of iron, and the Hebrew poetry parallel says what? You'll shatter them like earthenware. Those two ideas are parallel. So the breaking and shattering, I think, is the idea that will occur at the second advent. So it seems that as you compare Psalm 2-9 with all those passages in Revelation about Jesus ruling or shepherding with a rod of iron, the Messiah will smash the enemy with a rod of iron at a second coming, but will also rule the nations and the kingdom with a rod of iron as well. And those would be the believers of the nations that weren't destroyed. Because Zechariah 14, 16 says there are those among the nations that did not go up against Jerusalem. They go into the kingdom. And then you also have the sheep and the goats. Remember Matthew 25? The sheep are believing Gentiles who go into the kingdom. The goats go into the lake of fire. So is it possible he comes back to smash them with a rod of iron, but he'll still rule with a rod of iron those in the kingdom with strict judgment and authority and power. And his judgment will come swift. No sitting in a cell for 20 years waiting for something to happen. So that's how I think you can blend these passages together. It's not easy because there's still other questions that could come up, but that's how I see it. So when Christ returns in Revelation 19, the sword that comes out of his mouth and the rod by which he smites the enemy, I think both describe instruments of warfare at least at the second coming. So go with me now to Isaiah 11. Another prophecy about Christ's rule in the millennial kingdom that's still future. Isaiah 11, we'll just go to verse 4, which is already on the slide. And notice the switch in language, as we'll see in verse 4, but let's read verse 1. So this is when the kingdom is established. The parallel to this would be Isaiah 2, also a kingdom passage. Isaiah 11, 1, then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse. Who is Jesse? David's father. So Jesse brings forth King David, and Messiah is in the line of David. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. I think this is Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord... Now, the Holy Spirit will rest on him. Who's him? The Messiah. And what is the Spirit called? The Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Well, those are good credentials for a ruler, wouldn't you say? And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Here it is, verse 4, but with righteousness who will judge the afflicted and decide with fairness the afflicted of the earth. So he'll be a perfectly righteous ruler. And he, now notice, here it is, the last part of the verse. He will strike the earth with the rod of his what? His mouth. Notice it's not the broadsword that comes out of his mouth here, but now it's not the, the scepter that he rules. Here it's the rod of his mouth. I mean, Revelation saying the sword comes out of his mouth, now the rod of his mouth. And with it, the breath of his lips, he'll slay the wicked. So that kind of adds another dimension to the discussion. But clearly, when Jesus comes back to rule, he will strike the earth. He will defeat his enemies. And then he'll establish the kingdom. So some theology say it'll get real good and then get real, real good as if the church is going to bring in Jesus through its obedience. Not that we shouldn't obey, but that isn't how this is going to work. The, t- the, the church will be raptured. It'll get so bad in the seven years that Jesus has to return and defeat the enemy with the worst judgment this world's ever seen to then bring in a kingdom of righteousness. It's the opposite of how some people are teaching Bible prophecy. Jesus said, if I hadn't cut those days short, no person would have survived. But for the sake of the elect, those days were cut short. How is that everything getting better to usher Jesus in? 
read your Bibles and be careful what you hear out there. So Christ shepherding his people and believers co-ruling or shepherding with him is consistent with Old Testament scripture. Go to Jeremiah 23, another prophecy. How many times do I come back to this one? This one has so much going for it just in six verses. So notice Christ will shepherd as the king in the kingdom, but he'll also raise up co-shepherds. So there's got to be co-rulers with him. So Jeremiah 23, 1. Of course, the prophet gives a woe to the shepherds or the leaders of Israel who weren't shepherding well. He says, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Are these literal sheep or human beings? It's human beings. It's metaphorical. So the shepherds are false leaders who aren't taking care of God's people. All this is Ezekiel 34. Just read the entire chapter of Ezekiel 34. That's what this is. Therefore, says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. Ah, now it's people, right? The sheep become people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away, and you have not attended them. Ezekiel 34. Behold, I'm about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. So God's the true shepherd who will truly govern his people. And didn't Jesus offer this rule? He says, I am the good shepherd, John 10. They didn't want it. Verse 3, then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their pasture. Well, that, was obviously, that is obviously a reference to the promised land. That is Israel's pasture. And they will be fruitful and multiply. So when the Lord regathers Israel into their promised land and Jesus rules as king, there's going to be tremendous blessing. Verse 4, here it is with co-rulers. I will also raise up shepherds over them. Plural? Yes. And they will tend them. So there's going to be those who co-rule with Christ. And they will not be afraid any longer, nor terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. You may think the Lord has lost his eye on you. No way. He always knows where you are. As the military says, you never leave a man behind. He will never leave any one of his behind. Then verses 5 and 6, Behold, days are coming, so kingdom, future. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. So there's that one in the line of Jesse and David. Jesus Christ, and he'll reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. That's when he rules in the promised land in the future. In his days, Judah will be saved or delivered. Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So Jesus bears the name Yahweh because it's Yahweh Sidkenu. Is that happening now? Is, it, is Judah and Israel dwelling securely and Jesus ruling on the throne of David? No. So we're not in the kingdom now. That's future. This has to happen before, and Jesus has to be on earth in Jerusalem in a rebuilt temple. What does the temple mount look like now? Not what we're looking for. So at the second advent, Jesus Christ will be ruling or shepherding his people. And there will be others co-shepherding with him. He does delegate responsibility. And then the last part of Revelation 19.15. It says that he, that's Messiah, treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Well, we'll begin here next time. So as we close, I just want to get you to think of something. I mean, most of you that I know in here are children of God, but maybe just take some time to evaluate why you're going to be in heaven. It had nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the Lord. And then you'll remember to go give the gospel to somebody who needs to hear this. So I like this picture. You have a great chasm that obviously man cannot jump. I always say, just imagine it's 
100 yards across and a mile deep. Well, man can't jump that, so God made a way of escape. He made a bridge for us, if you will, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He gave one way of escape to man. That's it. And Jesus did something on that cross to make that way of escape possible. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross, so that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness, for by his wound you were healed. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us. The sinless Son of God became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Jesus bears the sins of the world on the cross, and so a bridge is now there. But does that mean you're saved simply because a bridge is there? No. It makes all men savable, but you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And so hopefully, if you've never done that, you'll make that decision. Because John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, indicates that we must believe in him to receive the benefits of the cross. So Jesus dies on the cross, rose on the third day. Anyone who believes in him has resurrected life. John 11.25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and he who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked, do you believe this? So that, it's your choice. You either believe it and be saved and receive eternal life, or if you've never done that, just continue to reject it, and you'll face eternal judgment if you die in that condition. I mean, the answer seems pretty obvious to me of what decision you have to make. And make that clear to someone else who doesn't know the Savior, give the gospel to them, and the Holy Spirit will convict in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment, and then we pray that He will make that decision to believe. So, I will see you in a week if you have a boat, maybe, and get home okay. Hopefully, the rain will dissipate a little bit next week. But let's take a moment to pray, and then we will um, have final song. And Hey, we have a fellowship lunch coming up. When is the party? Is it next week? The week after, two weeks, Reuben's son's turning a year old, so. Well, Sarah, we're going to talk about you because you're the mother. It's Mother's Day. So we're going to celebrate that and have, a, have our Sunday fellowship lunch a, a, a week early. So that ought to be a lot of fun. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your son, who you sent at his first advent to save us, if we would be willing to believe in him. We thank you that he did die on that cross and rose on the third day. We know he's alive and well. There's nowhere on this planet where you'll find the bones of Jesus Christ. He was risen. He is at your right hand waiting to return to this earth to make his enemies a footstool of his feet. And we have nothing to worry about as believers because when he returns, we come with him. We are his holy ones made holy because of his sacrifice. So in him we stand sanctified. So we thank you for the great promise of the future that we have. But may we be diligent to give the gospel to those who don't know you so that they can join the body of Christ and avoid eternal judgment. So Father, we just come here today to praise you. May we praise you all week and may we praise you as we meet again next Sunday. In Jesus we pray, amen.